Welcome to the podcast from Infotagen, the independent fact-checking service to combat fake news about the coronavirus. This is the first major public health crisis in the age of social media disinformation, and we're here to try and make sense of it. In this podcast, we'll be focusing on the response to COVID-19 in Singapore and the introduction of track and trace tools to monitor the spread of the virus. I'm Damien Collins, MP, co-founder of Infotagen and former chair of the House of Commons Select Committee for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. And I'm here with our resident experts, the disinformation analyst, Dr. Charles Creel, and John Quinlan, the CEO of Iconic Labs. Today, we'll be joined by our special guest from Singapore, Dr. Shashi Jai Kumar, who heads the Centre of Excellence for National Security at Nanyang University, and Carol Soon, a research fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. They'll be followed by Tom Presley, who is based in London, where he is the Vice President for International Marketing of Everbridge, who are the largest critical event management company in the world. So Charles, if I could come to you first, it's been quite a busy week uh, since the last uh, podcast. Uh, Donald Trump in America suggesting that disinfectant could be the solution to a coronavirus. And it would also seem much more focus on uh, politics in, in China around coronavirus too. But what have you been picking up this week? Uh, well, thanks for uh, having me on, Damien. I mean, first, kids don't mainline Clorox. That's really important. Um, what I've really noticed this week is that my two least favorite disseminators of disinformation, uh, Nigel Farage and Andrew Wigmore, are at it again. But this time they're promoting coronavirus conspiracies on Twitter. Um, Newsweek magazine published an unusually clickbaitish and overheated headline that read, quote, the controversial Wuhan lab experiments that may have started the coronavirus pandemic. Um, In the actual story, you learn that the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency released an assessment in January, and they said that the outbreak probably occurred naturally. But now they've updated that assessment to say that there's a possibility the virus was was released accidentally by a Wuhan lab lab, um, due to unsafe laboratory practices. Um, Now, it's worth noting that between January and now, Trump has appointed Richard Grinnell, who's a loyalist to head that agency, but both Farage and Wigmore are promoting the story, and Farage has called for China to allow independent investigators into the country. Um, Why Newsweek has gone rogue on that story is absolutely anyone's guess. It's out of character. Um, Another story that's out there is from the pages of Infotagion.com. There have been several posts on social media that have made the claim that the first volunteer in the Oxford Vaccine Group's COVID-19 vaccine trial has died. Well, she hasn't. She's a microbiologist. Her name is Dr. Alyssa Granato, and she appeared on BBC News to say that she's just fine. What's interesting here to me is that the story originated in several languages on a purported news site called n5ti.com. And that site was launched in March of this year. It carries almost nothing but coronavirus stories. Uh, It's already been blocked from renewal by ICANN, which is the International Registrar of Domain Names, but it can still operate until March of next year. So it's worth keeping an eye out for stories from there, and they'll absolutely be false. And then finally, in a real surprise move and coming from the States, Fox News has cut ties with a duo of Donald Trump supporting divas. They're called Diamond and Silk, and they're an African-American pair of commentators known for their vocal support of Trump. Uh, Since 2016, they've made sycophantic appearances on Fox News, and they regularly vlog on the Fox Nation streaming service. Lately, They've been on coronavirus, and they've promoted several over-the-top conspiracies. They've equated vaccines with abortion and genocide. They've claimed that the New York City death toll was inflated and wanted to know where the bodies are buried. And they've also claimed that the virus was man-made and deliberately spread. Now, according to CNN, Fox has dropped them, and the Diamond and Silk vlog disappeared quietly in the night. I'm sure not everyone will be weeping at that news. 
Um, <laughs> Not at all. Uh, but but it does show that, that that I think the seriousness around coronavirus is forcing people to take decisions over content and, and presenters and that maybe they should have taken in the past but just didn't. That's absolutely true. And it's a really uncomfortable position for lots of channels um, because they're forced to uh, confront their pro how their programming comes from a political position that they're promoting, but also forced to confront the idea that a lot of this disinformation is coming from what were official and are official channels. And John Quinlan, if I could bring you in, uh, it's been a Again, a busy few days uh, at Infotagen, not least with the, the launch of uh, our Isolate the Lies campaign, encouraging people to send in what they see and to check what they see before sharing it. Perhaps you can give us a bit of an update from Infotagen. Yep, sure, Damien. Um, so I think, as, as always, there's a few sort of, well, on the surface, funny things we get in, but obviously have a serious sort of um, theme behind them. And then there's some things like Charles mentioned before that about, for example, that volunteer in the... Uh, in the Oxford vaccine groups, um, search for a vaccine potentially dying and that just being absolutely not true. But one of the ones that I've sort of thought of, which was always thought was particularly creative, shall we say, was that we had a, uh, a Facebook post sent in to us, um, which says that COVID-19 stands for the Certificate of Vaccination Identification by Artificial Intelligence. And that's the C-O-V-I-D, and then the AI being the first and the ninth letters of the alphabet, so 19. So someone's clearly <laughs> thought a lot about that one. Uh, that one as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's exceptional. Um, so that one, that one's someone we had in. Um, we had the comet, uh, something that was created on a comet sent in. Um, so delighted to sort of fact check them. Um, I think, you know, on a wider social media um, sort of, uh, seen and this is another thing that we've had in obviously is is the stuff about Trump's disinfectant claims um, which I won't go into too much but one of the things that we've seen on social media generally is actually people's reaction to that um, lots of memes um, and you know the reaction of Dr. Burks uh, the scientific advisor has been watched over 21 million times and um, there's if anyone hasn't seen it there's a TikTok um, that which is which is excellent um, by a comedian called Sarah Cooper that's got over 15 million views um, doing an impersonation of Donald Trump. Um, it's very very good. So I would I would encourage everyone to see that if they can. No, I see that it's very funny, and she also does the uh, uh, her interpretation of the reaction of the doctor as well, which I thought was uh, to, to yeah comes advice. I mean, testing. Yeah, look as 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 someone in a sort of our, our let's call it our other job of uh, creating sort of content and content that people share. Um, when when we saw the zoomed in um, sort of uh, clip of of Dr. Burks, you know that's just like perfect material for everyone. So um, yeah, she she referenced that as well. That's, and just just to say, Invitation receives uh, content from people via the website Invitation dot com. But with the Isolate the Lies campaign, we're also saying that people can hashtag uh, Isolate the Lies. And we will try and pick up those uh, posts on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter as well as people sending them into Invitagen. That, that's great. Yep, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Now, if I could bring in our first of our guests for this podcast, and firstly, uh, Shashi Jayakumar and Carol Soon, who are joining us via Zoom from Singapore. It's fantastic to have you with us on the podcast. Thank you for your support with our work with Infotagen. I think Singapore is very interesting, both in terms of its response to coronavirus, having a major outbreak before the UK and dealing with a, a second wave. Uh, so we're very interested to learn more about that, uh, to learn about the experience of Singapore and things like um, track and trace to try and um, control the contagion. But also, I was very interested, when I first met uh, Shashi, it was discussing the general issues around disinformation and the work Singapore was doing to create new laws and legal responsibilities to act against disinformation spreading on social media. And I wondered if I could ask um, both Shashi and Carol if they could give us their perspective on the introduction of those laws in Singapore and, and how effective they think it's been in trying to control the spreading of viral disinformation. Sure. 
I, I wonder if I, I should begin, Damien, if that's agreeable to, to you and to, to Carol as well. And I'll speak for a few minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. I'll speak for a few minutes, and I'll speak for a few minutes on these issues which you, you've touched on, Damien. I, I think for those of you who, who don't know, Singapore is a remarkably diverse and cosmopolitan country, resident population 5.6 million, according to some surveys, the most diverse country on the planet. So you've got Chinese, Malays, Indians, that's the race groups, Eurasians as, Eurasians as well. You've also got uh, diverse religions, Hindus, Confucians, uh, Buddhists, uh, uh, Islam is, is represented as well. So it's very, very diverse. In terms of the numbers, we have reached today almost 15,000 cases, just 14, one, four fatalities, mainly elderly, and a number have been dis discharged, of course. The 15,000, the very, very large proportion of that number is from foreign workers, mainly construction workers and so on, mainly from South Asia. Many, most of them actually live in purpose-built dorms in, in Singapore. And it's important to bear this in mind when you look at the numbers, because in terms of the Singapore permanent resident or Singapore citizen infection rate for the past few days, indeed weeks, it's actually been, been rather low. We're talking about 20, 30, some days it's in the, the tens, just to, just to give you a sense of the, the, the numbers. We are reaching uh, the middle point of what would be a two-month lockdown light, if you like. I, I call it that because even though the official name is Circuit Breaker, it's basically a lockdown. But some restaurants can remain open if you deliver if for customers who want takeaway. Individuals can go and exercise, although quite restricted in terms of where they can go. And mask is compulsory if you, if you leave the home. In the earlier part of the Singapore government response, I think the response is relatively good. We en enacted a ministerial team to look at these issues and various other preparations well before the first imported case came into Singapore. So for the first part, I think we did relatively okay. And I, and I should add, for those of you who, who do or don't know Singapore well, it's actually in the DNA of Singapore's leadership. I was formerly from government, so I can tell you, a nation which from birth, which is a painful separation from Malaysia in 1965, feels very, very vulnerable. Some might almost say this sense of fragility comes from a, a paranoia in the political elite. So it's kind of a calculated paranoia, which is what keeps Singapore going. The leadership itself is, I would say, respected. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, who is the son of the modern founding father of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, is the Prime Minister. He's widely respected, personally popular. And it is his interventions, televised interventions in particular, which have been critical to calming the ground, because on a few occasions, you've had what looked like might be the beginnings of panic buying, hoarding in supermarkets. So when he intervenes, by and large, he leaves it to the ministerial team. But when he intervenes in three of Singapore's four official languages, which is English, Mandarin, and, and Malay, these have provided quite a lot of needed reassurance to the, to the ground. The resilience is a point for the leadership. It's a point I do want to stress, because within one or two years, this is a new generation. We call it the fourth generation leadership, which is about to take over the reins of power. There's going to be a general election, which must be held within the next year. We operate on the Westminster, Westminster parliamentary model. And this current period where newer leaders are tasked key roles within the task force may well be, be the making of some, of some of these younger leaders. And Prime Minister Lee has himself indicated he's going to step down at some point after the, the next election. I do want to spend a little bit of time on the foreign worker dorms issue because there have been some observers who pointed out that the authorities should have upped the game, upped the ante, in terms of spotting that this was a potential trouble spot quite early on. We had early vigilance against community spread for the Singapore citizen population. And I think that some of this testing, some of this vigilance should have been going into the dorms where the foreign workers stay in very, very closely packed confines, should have gone in there at an, at an earlier stage. Now, since infotagion is about disinformation, misinformation, and fake news, I, I think I should quickly zoom into those, those aspects. Damien, as you know, uh, academics and researchers have settled on this sweet spot in terms of differentiating misinformation, disinformation. Misinformation can be unwitting, it's got an element of unknowing, sometimes not intentional. Whereas disinformation, I think many academics now agree, should be defined as something calculated much more maliciously calculated to, to harm. 
Singapore has seen some of both. There's been a fair amount of both. For example, just yesterday, a gentleman has been charged in court for spreading fake news concerning how supermarkets are going to be closed. He spread this on a popular Facebook group. He's been charged with communicating a false message, potentially uh, faces a jail term. So social media messages suggesting enormous amounts spent by COVID patients at public, publicly subsidized hospitals. Again, false, because with very few exceptions, if you're a Singapore citizen, you are going to get free treatment for, for COVID in Singapore hospitals. There has also been some, I wouldn't call it disinformation, but racist post letters to mainstream media, sometimes the Chinese media, concerning the unsanitary and unhygienic allegedly habits of the foreign workers in dorms. You could say this is their opinion and people are entitled, but personally, I'm glad that ministers have come in to say that this has to do more with the conditions in which they live and that the reviews themselves are, are, are racist. Singapore WhatsApp groups are very, very popular and quite often misinformation circulates in WhatsApp groups, the one which you can't exit, which is the family WhatsApp group. And I think the government has done a wise thing by being connected to, to the people by an official, if you like, WhatsApp group. Several hundred thousand people uh, every day get news and debunked fake news on this official uh, WhatsApp uh, channel in order to, to get clarifications. So various people and agencies have upped their game, which is very, very necessary. As I mentioned, within the next year, you are going to have uh, a general election, perhaps sooner rather than, than later. I think the powers that be do want to see whether the ability to debunk, to correct, to give the reassurance is fine-tuned, even through this, this tragedy that we're, we're going through right, right now. A final word on OFMA, which is the acronym of Prote Protection Against Online Falsehoods and Manipulations. It was enacted last year. It has started to be used from late last year. And it, it has been used on various instances. What has made some people very unhappy is that it's been used against members of the political opposition. And the criticism is that this should, there are other means and mechanisms such as official government rebuttals which should be used instead, in such as, in, instead of such a high-profile law. My personal view is that this law is probably going to be fine-tuned as, as time passes. The authorities have also spoken against a, on a potential law on foreign interference, which has been in the works for, for some time. We have not yet seen that, that bill come to pass yet. But whether it's the foreign interference bill, which has not yet come to pass, whether it's POFMA, the issue is whether you can actually get at the various individuals who spread the, this kind of news in the first place. Because like the chap who was talking about the supermarkets on social media, you get people clearly with nothing better to do, or some militias calculating and homebrewing this kind of stuff. And that itself is very, very worrying. So I'm going to pause here, but of course, uh, prepare to take questions later on. Uh, thanks so much, um, Cheshire. That's great. And a question perhaps, um, perhaps Carol would like to, to respond on. Um, I know I've been very interested in the work that you've done on disinformation in, in Singapore, but as well as charges being brought against individuals for, for spreading disinformation, do you think it's changed the behaviour of companies like Facebook towards acting against known sources of disinformation on their platforms? Well, let me first thank um, they, uh, thank you for having me on the Infotagion podcast. And I think um, that's a great question. And Shashi has given a very good context about Singapore and, um, well, how um, our society and, um, um, you know, history has made for certain kind of a approach when it comes to, even in this case, regulating against misinformation and disinformation. So um, I will perhaps begin by um, painting, uh, hopefully, a vivid picture of what we are currently experiencing when it comes to the coronavirus or COVID-19 um, misinformation and disinformation landscape. And after which I will specifically address your question, which I think is linked to also Shashi's earlier point pertaining to POFMA. So if we look at what's happening in Singapore right now, um, there are different types of um, narratives that are flooding the information and communication landscape. We have, of course, um, and this is similar to what um, Charles and had earlier spoken, as, as well as John, you know, highlighting some of the developments in the UK context. We have in Singapore some relatively localised narratives when it comes to misinformation and disinformation. So in the earlier days, um, uh, uh, you mentioned the first wave, uh, we saw misinformation uh, uh, targeted um, affecting people's day-to-day -day lives um, and with the consequence of increasing certain amounts of fear and anxiety. So we're talking about 
you know, um, misinformation on the closure of schools and high institutions of living and rumors being circulated in discussion forums as well as instant messaging apps uh, not to go to certain hospitals because there were a number of cases, infected cases, and uh, which are the hotels and hospitals to avoid, etc. Uh, and then we have, you know, narratives that, well, POFMA probably have lesser control over, which is what we are observing that's taking place at the international level, at the international arena. And here would be some of the things that you have discussed, alluded to earlier, as well as in your previous Infotation podcast about the conspiracy theories that are being lobbied between China and the US. So in terms of uh, POFMA, uh, what we have seen so far is um, two main categories of actions that have been taken against the perpetrators of the disinformation and misinformation relating to COVID-19. One of which, which is uh, a provision under the POFMA bill, uh, which is to enable the government to issue targeted correction directives, which it has done so in a couple of instances um, to individual publishers. For example, in Singapore's context, the quite notorious The States Times Review. If you notice the name, you know, it kind of parodies one of our largest legacy media in Singapore. Um, and it has also issued general correction directive to um, a hardware zone discussion forum as well as to uh, Facebook. So what we are seeing here is POFMA is relatively unique um, comparing compared to what with uh, the, the kind of measures that we have seen from other countries. Um, because generally the rule of thumb is we leave that the government leaves the offending or false posts online but requires the publisher, be it an individual website or a social media platform, to publish the corrective information alongside the misinformation. So the idea and the philosophy behind this approach is, well, we are, um, it, it is not censoring the post, it's not requiring the takedown and the removal of the information, but it simply requires the publishing of the, of the corrective information. So the idea is, Number one, do not want to overreach and censor speech and freedom of expression. But on the other hand, it allows people to have access to the official authoritative or credible information. So we have seen that um, Facebook has uh, relented and has published one of the corrections um, despite articulating uh, its um, disagreement and its discomfort with the move. So we are seeing some of that happening. Um, with the with regards to your question about, say, the efficacy of it, I think what's useful, one possible usefulness of this is the fact that it enables individuals or members of the public to have the correct information from which they can use to debunk false information which is circulated within their individual and personal networks. So we are seeing a fair bit of debunking that's happening at the national level by various government agencies and ministries, but they can only do so much. I'm currently in the midst of um, analysing a set of data that I have collected from more than 2,000 Singaporeans. And one of the questions that I ask the respondents is what type of verification methods do they use to confirm the authenticity of the information that they encounter online, particularly information that they think might be false? Um, and well, um, the most common and the most popular step is to ask family and friends or colleagues. And the least popular verification method is to go to a fact-checking website. So clearly, there's a lot of um, uh, things that are going around in personal networks, um, the circulation on closed communication platforms like WhatsApp. And hence, in, at the end of the day, legislation such as POFMA uh, or even the impending Foreign Interference Act would, as the government has acknowledged, its limitation. Um, so we need to see what more we can do to bolster people's immunity and resilience 
uh, by enabling them with the mechanisms to so-called take action into their own hands. Um, I mean, when Shashi was speaking earlier, he mentioned the, the uh, a sort of official WhatsApp channel which the government uses to respond to uh, uh, stories that are known to be false. And is that actually, rather than just giving out general public information advice, actually debunking myths that are circulating to uh, and doing it by sharing it back through messaging apps rather than di- just simply directing people to fact-checking sites? Uh, I'll come in briefly, and then maybe Carol would like to come in. I think the official WhatsApp group, which has several hundred thousand members, last time I checked, needs to be supplemented by the official uh, government pages and fact-checking websites. These include Factually, and these include Gov.sg, and also the MOH, which is the Ministry of Health website. And they, these websites put out in a very clear and transparent fashion, let's say the MOH website would say, we're aware of this rumor concerning a death here or death there or inf- a new outbreak of infections here or there. And this is false. And sometimes when more explications needed, they, they will say, this is false or distortion and, and so on and so forth. So it's not just the WhatsApp channel, which can be useful, but it's also the, the, the various websites which, which are being used. I'm not sure if you want to car- car- uh, come in here, Carol. Yes, um, uh, in fact, the WhatsApp uh, account, it's the first time um, the government has used the instant messaging app directly to reach out to members of the public. I think if we look at the daily uh, messages that we receive in English as well as the other three vernacular languages, the information that is sent to the subscribers basically falls into three categories, one of which would be the very regular updates on the number of infections and the number of clusters that they have identified. The second category would be reminders of key measures that have been recently uh, rolled out, for instance, certain measures pertaining to the circuit breaker. And the third, at times, it is used to debunk specific information. And yes, it does contain links to um, and reminder for subscribers to consult official channels like Factually as well as the Ministry of Health website where there is a detailed list of the various types of falsehoods that emerged since the beginning of the outbreak in Singapore at which puts us at about um, I think around late January after the lunar Chinese New Year. Mm. So, just, just, to add, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. just to add, Carol, the government itself has been forced to up its game in this social media age. Within the last few weeks, they've had to launch platforms on Telegram. So Gov.sg is on Telegram. And, yes. also Twitter. and this has happened just within the last few weeks, purely on account of, of COVID, I think. Yeah. But I think, uh, uh, um, if I may, uh, besides the government, it's also heartening to see how um, the other segments of the community are stepping up to do their bits. So we see individuals uh, reaching out to vernacular communities by producing their own videos and updates in various Chinese dialects. Um, So these individuals and groups uh, debunk information, but they also reinforce key messages that have been put out by the mainstream media and the government, uh, be it the observation of uh, personal hygiene uh, or... Um, you know, the, or the debunking of um, further falsehoods. It's, it's interesting there's an approach, the, the way in Singapore people are going out to the channels that people use to communicate rather than directing them to a government page or a fact check site to actually try and recirculate the corrected information back through the channels people are actually using. But I wonder if I could just bring in Tom uh, Presley here as well. Tom is from... Uh, Everbridge, who are a uh, critical event management company. And Tom, uh, part of our discussions on the Invitation podcast are around looking at the role of tech in our society, seeking to debunk uh, the falsehoods and the disinformation that circulates. But underpinning all of that in a way is also the question of how we can make sure tech is used for good. And in some ways, that's where I think you come in and and your company comes in. And particularly into the debate we're having now around... um, I suppose what's been called track and trace as a way of managing the uh, the response to COVID-19. Obviously, Singapore has got its trace together 
app. Uh, there's a similar app that's been launched, I think, using a similar sort of database in Australia. And I know that you've got views as to whether these app-based services are effective or whether we should be using other forms of technology to help uh, monitor uh, the spread of the virus and warn people if they've been in close proximity to others that have got it. Yeah, hi, everyone. And, uh, and hi, Damien. Thanks very much for having me on. Um, you're absolutely right. I think we're, we're now entering a very interesting phase in the pandemic. Um, and I sort of think you've seen that the phase has sort of been played out certainly in the UK, where there has been lots of uh, experimentation going on with traditional types of technology, traditional channels of communication. And now we're very much sort of entering into the app stage. So if you take the UK as an example, uh, I think everyone will remember receiving a, a text message from the government uh, that came out over a sort of a 48-hour period. There was then a letter through the post, and we obviously have our, our TV updates as well. Um, and I think that they're, they're sort of more... Uh, reliable, let's say, trusted uh, forms of communication. And I think there's some very interesting pieces that uh, Shashi and Carol actually raised from what's been learned in Singapore um, about how that technology has been used. And I'm just going to praise countries like Singapore for how quickly they've actually stood up technology to help fight the pandemic. And I think in other sort of countries, perhaps in, in Europe, we didn't mobilize that technology quite as quickly. But now we're sort of entering into the, the application stage. I think there's sort of two real fundamental parts of that that, that need to be considered in order to, to have the right blend of technology to make uh, a suitable um, technology, uh, technologically driven outcome to the next stage of the pandemic. And the two elements that are baked in there, one is, is data. And the second is communication. So on the data side, there are certain sort of critical elements to both of those parts that really need to be considered for a technology strategy to work. On the data side, you've got to consider that what the data that you're collecting has to be accurate. So uh, the, the information that you're going to be collecting via an app, how do you ensure that the, you know, the general public who are potentially going to be putting information into that application uh, is specific and uh, not full of error, I think, first off. Uh, the second part, I think once you have that data, and let's assume that, it's, that it's, it, it's accurate, there's always the discussion about the storage and security of that data and how it's accessed. Um, your third part then is you have the usage. So um, the, when you actually have all that information, and there's a lot of talk about the contact tracing piece when people are crossing paths, what information do you then give to a person as the next step of what they should do? Certainly in a situation at the moment where we haven't actually got proper testing um, set up across the country yet. So um, if you're giving highlighting the fact that you may have crossed or been in proximity with someone that has COVID-19, are you instructed to return home? Are you instructed to go to see a doctor? Are you instructed to go straight to hospital to get tested? And, and all of the sort of uh, the wider services that sit around that data collection then has to be considered. And that then takes me into the communication part and picks up on some of the interesting um, pieces that the guys were talking about earlier on around using uh, WhatsApp groups. Um, that there are certain elements within communication, and for Everbridge, this is where we spent the last 20 years really honing our expertise is first off, the, the element that you have to consider is, is reach. I think when um, Carol and, and, and Shashi were talking earlier on, they were talking about um, WhatsApp. It's an app. It lives on a smartphone. When you consider the most vulnerable people in the world, certainly in the UK, you have only about 40% of the people over 65 who actually have smartphones. So immediately you are sort of up against the, the wall in terms of being able to reach the, the necessary people that, that you want to, the most vulnerable in society. Um, you then have an element of uh, the message. Uh, we heard that obviously Singapore is a, is a very diverse country with lots of different languages within that. If you're going to send a message, and the, the UK message was delivered in, in, in English, um, and possibly negated the fact that there is going to be a requirement to communicate with people in multiple languages. So how do you actually then send that message out to make sure it delivers 
to the right people at the right moments with the right message um, and with with the right detail. Uh, we were actually uh, work with uh, the government of Norway, who when uh, a couple of weeks ago, when they were sending uh, their messaging out to their population, actually were able to send messages out in multiple language to foreign nationals. So another element to consider, not only the people that are within your population, but people that have been visiting the country while uh, the lockdown came into place and talking to and communicating clearly with them about what they should do. Should they go to transport hubs to exit the country, uh, risking more uh, passing on the, the, the virus to other people, or should they stay in lockdown? Um, and we were able to put a message in there to contact the authorities for the best advice. So lots of detail actually then goes into what the message is. And then you, the last sort of two elements is then, uh, and this I really think sort of deals into the, the human behavior element of, of all this, which is uh, the reliability of the channel that you're using and the, um, the trust that um, the receiver places in where that message came from. And we've actually uh, carried out a piece of research recently that we're going to be launching this week called Clarity Out of Chaos. Um, we uh, surveyed 9,000 employees in 13 different countries. And there's some very interesting facts that, that came out about that, that actually over half of the people that responded, actually more than half, close to, to um 60% actually found that they found that their employers as one of the most trusted and reliable sources of information, uh, whereas they would expect an initial message to come out from a government-led source. Um, you would actually receive that information um, more uh, frequently and updated from, from, from your individual employer. So it's an interesting blend around the communication part of that as well. So um, when we look at the actual technology pieces that are in place at the moment, there are a lot of these homegrown apps being um, sort of designated as the silver bullet for actually solving a lot of our issues coming out of this next stage of the pandemic. But there's a lot of detail and nuance um, within those, that, that sort of solution. And I, I sort of feel that it's, it's part of the overall puzzle and there is a need for a bit more of a holistic consideration of all these different elements in order to get uh, the actual approach right to ensure that the, the sort of recovery phase is properly resourced from a technology perspective. Yeah, I think you make a good point about the um, the technology that people have, because as you say, be, not everyone has a smartphone um, and therefore not everyone could use an app-based service. There seems to be an interesting sort of tension here as well between people's desire to use tools that will help us lift the uh, lockdown sooner and help us manage the uh, protection of citizens against the virus. But at the same time, a, a degree of caution about what sort of health data they're giving away and to whom and, and what that could be used for in the future. But presumably a, a system based around text messages is using data that's already held by public bodies and doesn't require gathering more. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so um, the, the Everbridge platform, um, we connect up with all the different network operators in different countries, develop relationships with that on behalf of governments and place our software within those networks. Um, and then it's powered off uh, SIM card use and phone number information. So we don't actually hold any private information at all. We see um, individuals as, as SIM cards, if you like, and can track people's movements around, in and out of a particular area. The SIM card gives you the language information um, because of the, the location where it's registered. Um, and it allows a lot, a lot more flexibility within that messaging uh, to get the sort of information back that you need. But that's why I sort of say that there is the, the reliability of the channel that you actually use, which you know, it, it, app-based technology is relatively new in the grand scheme of things, whereas you know, text-based uh, and SIM card um, communication has been around for many, many years and, and, and arguably is, is more reliable in that sense. But then there is coupling that with having the right access to the right data so you can deliver the right message to the right people at the right time. How, how, um, how localised can, can messaging be with a, with a tool like this? Because, I mean, if you live in a relatively large, densely populated place like, like Singapore or indeed like uh, London, um, the chances are that the, there, are, there are people within relative proximity to where you live who, you know, who have the virus or managing the virus. 
Uh, and so is there a danger people will be getting messages all the time or can you make it very localized? Uh, you can do both. Uh, and you can certainly make it very localized. I mean, I don't I refer back to uh, the, 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 the story that uh, Shashi was telling us earlier on about foreign workers in particular dorms. Now, that is something that could have been considered as a potential danger spot. Um, people living in very close proximity, not the best conditions. Um, uh, earlier on it, with the, the outbreak, there would be an ability to create in a, our control center, effectively draw a, a map around that area and be able to direct specific information and messaging to the people within that area. So you can get very uh, um, sort of specific to area uh, groupings and I think the the interesting part of it uh, and you, you mentioned London there there are many different sort of component parts of London it's a very broad and spread out city uh, and you could actually look at segmenting London into different hotspot areas with this technology um, to get that message delivered correctly to the right people and that has benefits in itself by um, managing the throughput of uh, the data through the network towers. So, I mean, you, you'll have noticed when the text messages went out in the UK, it did take about 48 hours to deliver that message to the population because multiple different uh, network providers um, were sending the message by themselves without any type of coordination over um, a time period that they defined themselves. Whereas uh, a solution like Everbridge would be able to look into the networks, understand what traffic is available, and send specific messages to specific areas and be confident of uh, the, the pace of delivery of those messages during a certain time period. Um, Carol, and, and I mean, Shashi, I mean, what's your view on the, the use of apps like Trace Together in Singapore? Do you think it's been a success? Do you think there's a good public up, uptake to use services like that? Maybe I'll chime in and um, uh, Shashi, please add to this. Uh, since its inception to date, we have about 1.1 million people in Singapore who have downloaded the app and are using it. Um, it's definitely uh, an insufficient and nowhere near the critical mass. Um, one of the ministers who leads the task force, the multi-ministry task force, has said that we would actually require about 75% of the population to subscribe and use the app in order for it to work effic um, efficaciously. And this is important because Singapore will end, as um, unless things develop, will, is likely to end up, um, its uh, extended circuit breaker sometime in early June. And we have heard from experts, not just in the local um, health community but all over the world saying that you know this this fight against COVID-19 is going to be a long and protracted one so even if we do you know uh, uh, see some loosening of restrictions um, after the first week of June and that's not a promise uh, we would need um, a, an app like Trace Together to help the government contain and the community com any community spread so um, so definitely Adoption um, needs to be higher, but I think one of the key things which um, inhibits people from doing so, and this is not unique to Singapore, is this almost instinctive um, uh, repulsion, right? In this fear of um, giving your data, uh, you surrendering your data to the government, when in actual fact, I think we need people to have a paradigm shift, a mindset shift, in terms of how they think about their personal data. I mean, just think about on a regular basis, what kind of information are we willingly and rationally surrendering to different people, right? To, to whether it's online dating apps or e-commerce sites or transportation apps like Waze. So um, I think people's inherent bias certainly needs to be addressed. And just one final comment about what Tom said about the communication ecology, a condition that needs to be fulfilled for a tech approach to work. Um, he mentioned reach, and I would want to kind of link this back to our discussion on uh, this information, uh, be it COVID-19 specific or this information in general. So recently, Oxford's Reuters Institute just published a study that talked about the 
um, the power of politic politicians, celebrities, and other prominent <coughs> public figures. And unfortunately, their power and their responsibility for producing and spreading claims, uh, false claims. So they found, based on the analysis, that 20% of the false claims are produced by what we call these Q givers or public opinion leaders. And their polls actually account for 69% of social media engagement. So I think um, we need to think about how we can leverage and tap on influencers uh, and prominent Q givers to combat this information and also promote the adoption of important technologies such as the digital contact tracing apps. Absolutely right. And we, at our previous uh, podcast, when um, we were talking to Shoshana Zubov about some of these issues around data gathering, um, it's interesting that we're having this debate about what data we want the government to have, but yet a lot of this is data and information that knowingly or not, we've given private companies already, uh, and that companies like Google and Facebook already, or Google in particular, already can track where we are and, uh, and what we're doing during different points of the day. Um, so it, there's a kind of, I think part of that concern is the fact that we've given away so much data without really realising what we were doing. And now we've become more concerned about whether we want to give it to other people and particularly yeah. naturally concerned about what we want the government to know we're doing. Yeah. Um, now I, I think um, we're sort of coming towards the end of our, our time for our, our discussion. But before we wrap up, I mean, uh, Charles and John, when you've been listening into the, the conversation, I don't know if there's any final questions you have for our guests or indeed if there are any other points that anyone would like to make. Um, well, I'm very interested in uh, what you have to say about the use of apps, but also tying this uh, to an earlier comment about uh, what people trust in terms of where they get their information. Uh, now Pew uh, Charitable Trust, which does a lot of research around online life, uh, just in the past week has published a study that showed that most Americans don't trust uh, tracking apps around coronavirus and don't think that they'll be effective. Um, and as long as these apps are an opt-in service, I think we're going to struggle to try to get uptake on them because people quite rightly uh, are very protective of their data. Now, one of the interesting things uh, to tie this to what we were saying about fact-checking sites earlier, that people tend to trust their friends and family for information more than they actually trust fact-checking sites and verification of news stories. And, and this is reflected also in Europe and the United States. And it points to the importance that emotions and emotional attachment end up playing in, in terms of both promoting disinformation, if that's your gig, um, or countering disinformation, if that's what you're trying to do. And I, I think what's not happening with the um, tracking apps is that a good emotional story is being told about them. A compelling emotional narrative uh, needs to be wrapped around it to encourage people. Now, unfortunately, perhaps as we lose more people to coronavirus, that may be built into the DNA. Um, but it's something that I think that uh, governments need to work on. Uh, but of course, as well, for businesses in particular, the, the story may become, if you, the sooner you start using these apps, the quicker we can start to um, lift the lockdown. Indeed. Yeah, I think if I can make one final comment, I, I think ultimately here, the, the fact is that Without a constant, steady stream of reliable, up-to-date, um, specific information, people will fill a void, any information void, by going out and finding out their own answers. That's that's just the sort of a, a, an age we live in where people expect to have information delivered to their fingertips um, whenever they want it. And uh, there is a certain pace um, and regularity that people expect now of having this information come out. And I think that's why there is almost sort of feeling a beginning of restlessness in um, the different societies of the world where people are, are keen to understand what is happening in this next step. And I think the, the pace of information that comes out, especially when we try and exit this pandemic, the frequency has to increase in terms of how governments are communicating with uh, different people. And 
I think the only way to consider how that will will happen is a correct blend of those reliable technologies that work. Some may be app-based, some may be using more traditional uh, text and SMS methods, um, and working with some television, radio, and, and all the means available to a government. But I think really having a proper holistic um, solution around that, that that has that that reach and coverage to ensure that, that we're not leaving anyone behind in the delivery of those messages is really where the sort of big next focus has to be. It seems to me that um, we also need to not have uh, poster boys for government spread disinformation um, in order <laughs> to get people to trust uh, their governments more as well. Yes. It's, I think the key thing is that what, how discreet you can keep this data, that if it's being shared to help deal with a public emergency like uh, coronavirus, uh, that it's used for that, that that doesn't become part of a general generalised data set that becomes available to the government for other services or indeed other other private pro- providers. Um, I'm sure people still want to carry on misleading their doctor and their bank manager as much as they have done in the past without leaving a data trail to uh, to expose their lies. Hmm. Um, I think that, that brings us towards the uh, end of our, our discussion. It's been sort of fascinating to talk through these things. And I think uh, Shashi and Carol, I mean, it's been brilliant to get your insights from Singapore, which I think we've, uh, we've a lot to learn from what's happening in, in countries like Singapore as we work through uh, these issues in the UK. And I think this debate around, around uh, tracing uh, technology and tracking trace is going to be an important part of how we work through the next few months of, of coming out of the period of lockdown and learning, I suppose, to live with managing coronavirus in the next, probably over the next few months and probably into next year. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank Thanks you. very much. You've been listening to the Infotagion podcast, hosted by me, Damien Collins MP, featuring Charles Creel, John Quinlan, Shashi Jai Kumar, Carol Soon, and Tom Presley. It was produced by Lucy and David Dagahi. You can find out more about Infotagion and send us examples of disinformation you've seen by visiting our website, infotagion.com, or using hashtag isolate the lies on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you until next time. Thank you until next time. Thank you until next time.